<laughs> Daddy said, get going. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, Nathan says to get going, so here we go. All right, uh, good morning. Could you turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, in your Bibles and also uh, my translation of uh, that verse? And uh, also in your, in your songbooks, we're going to do, because the subject today is on Thanksgiving, uh, we're going to do that uh, congregational song that we do uh, called Give Thanks. And uh, I can tell you what that page is in the songbooks. It's on page 44 in the songbooks, Give Thanks. And that's our subject here this morning. We're going to finish off Colossians 3.15 where Paul uh, talks, uh, uh, instructs the Colossians to give thanks. And we'll see what he wants them to give thanks for. So, and it's related, obviously, to what we taught on last week and the week before. So that is our subject here this morning, Colossians 3.15. Uh, just a few announcements before we get underway. This is obviously for the people who are not familiar with our ministry. They pop into our website from time to time, checking us out. And uh, whether it's on the website or YouTube, they pick up the thing, or uh, Facebook or wherever they see it, Google+. Plus. So uh, our class schedule for those individuals is uh, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings from 7 to 8, and also, of course, Sunday mornings, 9 to, I think, quarter past 10 or whatever. Uh, we have um, a prayer meeting at the end of class on Thursday evening, which our internet people join us with. Yeah. And then we have uh, a prayer meeting on Sunday after our Sunday brunch that Jody Thompson uh, prepares, and also uh, uh, Crystal and Bill uh, contribute to that as well. And um, so... Uh, all, every class is different. Every sermon is different because we're an expository ministry. We go through the different books of the Bible, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, chapter by chapter. And in between books, we do uh, different subjects. So uh, we just finished the book of Zephaniah during our weekday classes. And now we're going to be doing a series on the church for a couple of months. We'll be doing various subjects related to the church like election, predestination, adoption, the baptism of the Spirit, spiritual gifts, our heavenly citizenship, all these things we'll be learning in the next couple of weeks during our weekday classes. And then the next book we're going to do is First John. So I'm already working on that book for you. So uh, that will, uh, uh, that's the next book we're going to be doing during our weekday classes. On Sundays, we've been engaged in a study in Paul's epistle to the Colossians. We're uh, in the midway point of chapter 3. So we're going to be continuing with that study here this morning. And also, uh, the first Sunday of the month, we observe the, the communion table, the Lord's Supper. So that'll be at the end of our class here this morning. And then we have a Sunday morning offering. Uh, we only take an offering on Sundays, and that's at the end of uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the class, the lesson, and the communion service. So with that in mind, what are you eating over there? It looks good. The, the Cheerios? Cheerios, okay. Cheerios, those are good. I used to like Fruit Loops, too. Anyways, uh, so we got, uh, and if you're in the area, um, and we don't have our address on the website, there's a number on the website, it's my number, so you can call me, and I, we can give you a, a, a directions to the Thompson household here in Marion, and uh, the reason why we don't put their address out there on the internet is because there are crazy people out there, so anyways, uh, so if you want to know where we are, a lot of people already know where we are, but um, so uh, you can uh, give me a call if you're looking for directions. So anyways, with that in mind, uh, let's take a moment of silent prayer. This is our custom. We do this to examine ourselves and see if we need to confess any sins to the Father. 1 John 1, 9 teaches that if we confess our sins to the Father, he, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins with the result that he purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. So we maintain that fellowship through obedience to the Spirit, and he speaks to us through the Scriptures, which he's inspired. That's when we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit, and Colossians 3.16 to let the Word of Christ which we dwell in our souls a verse we're going to study uh, actually next Sunday. And, uh, and if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, uh, do what First Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. <laughs> He's got a funny face. <laughs> and uh, so with, uh, Connor, the, the, new, the new baby over here, uh, Bill and Crystal, he's got the funniest face on right now. His dad's rocking him. All right, let's take that moment of silent prayer. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for another beautiful day here in Iowa. We thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us in the temporal realm and also in the spiritual realm with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We thank you for everyone here this morning, not only in the Thompson home, but those who might be viewing this class right now through the website or at a later date, through the recordings on the website. We thank you, Father, for each and every one of them. We thank you, Father, for the Thompsons opening up their home to us four days a week, and we thank you for the sacrifices that they make in relation to that. We thank you, Father, for Titus' work with the sound and the recordings, the video, the audio. We thank you for his service, and we pray that you give him wisdom in that ear this morning. And uh, we thank you for those taking advantage of the technology. Uh, we thank you also for the, the food that Jody has prepared for us, the meal that she's prepared for us afterwards. We also thank you for uh, uh, the blessings related to our union identification with your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would help us to appropriate by faith this union and identification and consider ourselves dead to the sin nature and alive to you, Father, so that we can experience victory over sin and Satan. We thank you, Father, for your word in this study in uh, Colossians. We pray that you would bless us in this study here this morning. We pray that the Spirit would work mightily and powerfully through myself, help me to communicate accurately a word to your people, and also help your people by the Spirit understand what's being taught to make applications uh, application of what they're learning. We pray that you would break down any barriers that sin and Satan would put up to hinder that from happening. And we pray, Father, that ultimately we could bring glory to you by obeying what you've taught us in your word and thus manifesting the character and nature of your son and ultimately your character and nature, demonstrating that we're disciples of your son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you and praise you for another day and all the blessings that you've given to us in the temporal and spiritual realm. Thank you for what you've done for us in the past through your Son and the Spirit, are doing for us now and will do for us in the future and giving us a guarantee of a resurrection body and rewards if we're faithful. We thank you and praise you for another day, Father, of your word and to fellowship with each other and, your, and with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit. We also pray that you would help us in the song service, help us to sing by the power of the Spirit in a fashion that would be, bring glory to you and your Son, Jesus Christ. So it is in his name we pray. Amen. All right. Could you all rise, please? We're going to do give thanks. You ready to sing? You ready? Did he just fall asleep? Oh, he made a little squ squeam and then he's out like a light. This kid's great, huh? Gee. Me, 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 me. You ready? Oh, he reminds me of my nephews. They all did the same. They saw the guitar. They were like,
You may be seated. All right, it should be at Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, if you could. I'm going to read from the New American Standard uh, the first 15 verses of the chapter, and then we're going to look, finish off our study of Colossians 3.15 and, and note that final phrase and be thankful at the end of Colossians 3.15. Uh, you might want to know why I broke out this verse in three lessons. Uh, for the simple reason, there's a lot to t teach in, those, uh, in each of those lessons. If I went through just one hour or an hour and 15 minutes, whatever I do on Sunday, of this verse, you would have, think of all the stuff you would have missed. We actually, there's a lot of stuff that, we, that is found in this verse. So that's why I break it out. Um, in, a, in a narrative, uh, you very rarely ever see me do that in a narrative like Genesis or Exodus. I'll take big chunks of stuff because of a, a, a thought is in one paragraph or something like that. But when you talk about Paul's writings uh, in, in the epistles, you can do this. Like the Gospels, you can take big chunks a lot of times. Uh, but... Um, with the, the, with the epistles of Paul, there's many things that he's saying there, and I want us to understand what he's saying in the verse, and could I do the verse in one hour? Yes, I could, and there's nothing wrong with doing it in one hour, but in, uh, from where God is leading me, I can only do what God leads me to do. He might do, uh, have men do other things and to, you know, do a very abbreviated study of the verse. I don't do that. I like to go and explain to my people uh, what I've learned, what the verse says, and then and give, and communicate it to you. And sometimes one verse has got so much in it, so much content there, that it takes sometimes three lessons to do it. And this is and not all the time, but once in a, you know, you'll see it from time to time. So that's why I'm, I'm spent, you know, we're taking us three, three Sundays to finish off verse 15, is because there's a lot of things in the verse that need to be taught. And one of those things I wanted to spend a class on and we've touched upon it earlier in the epistle, and we'll, we'll talk about that, reiterate about that, that. Paul has talked about Thanksgiving from different perspectives earlier in the epistle, chapter 1. But uh, we never really spent the whole class on, what, on Thanksgiving, and I, I, I thought it very important. Even if I uh, have spent a class on Thanksgiving in the past, it, it bears repeating because this is one subject that actually will tell you where you are at spiritually as a believer. If you're an immature believer or a mature believer or somewhere in between. Because your attitude of gratitude reflects where, you're, where you are in your walk with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a reflection of how intimate a fellowship that you're having with God. And this is a very important subject, so that's why I wanted to spend a lesson on this particular subject because it's going to this in itself will help your prayer your prayer life exponentially it'll just your prayer life will be transformed because if there's nothing you can pray, think you can pray for there's always things you could thank god for in prayer and uh, i would start doing a list if you know i have a mental list that's i do everything with a mental list i can uh, and uh and people's names on I have by memory have a people on my uh, prayer list. I just have by memory because I've been doing it for so, every day for so many years that I remember. You know, I just remember these people without notes. But it, it's not nothing wrong with writing down things that you want to thank God for. And a lot of things we're learning in the Bible should be uh, used as uh, things that we should thank God for. Uh, and, uh, and what he's done for us in the past through his son and the spirit, what he's doing for us now and what he will do for us in the future. All of those are things that we should be thanking God for. Not just the temporal things, you know, our families and our jobs and our salaries and our, and our businesses. Uh, we should be thanking God for the spiritual things as well, not just the temporal things. So that in itself, will, you'll find yourself in prayer a lot longer than you ever thought you would be found in prayer. And when we start off as, as walking as children of God, our prayer life is very, um, you know, to say the, week, say the least, a big struggle. And, and it can be a struggle and will be a struggle for a mature believer. But when I say a struggle, struggling in prayer to think of things to say to God. And uh, of course, as you grow in God's word, 
you will find th plenty of things to talk to God about and thank him about in prayer. So that's our subject here this morning. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 in your Bibles. I'm reading from the New American Standard. It says in Colossians 3, 1, Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. See at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died with, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them... You also once walked when you were living in them, but now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there's no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man. But Christ is all and in all. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. And then he says, and be thankful. Uh, the phrase, and be thankful, is actually a result clause because the word in the New American Standard translated, in most English translations, the word translated and and that phrase is the conjunction chi, which is functioning as a marker of result. That means the chi is introducing this statement, be thankful, and it's the result of, uh, it's, it's, it's presenting the result of the previous clause. So this word is a marker of result, meaning it's introducing a command, be thankful is a command, which the Colossians must obey as a result of the Father effectually calling them into union with one body, the church of Jesus Christ, in order to experience the peace of God. So he's saying, be, in other words, when he gives this command to be thankful, he's saying this command is the result of God effectually calling you into union with one body in order so that you can experience the peace of God as individuals and as a, amongst each other. So remember we saw the phrase, uh, he says, to which indeed you were called in one body. He's saying the peace of Christ Rule, uh, governing your hearts as, as individuals and as a corporate unit is the purpose for which God called you into the body of Christ. So as a result of that, I want you to be thankful. So the, uh, the word for uh, thankful is the word euharistos. It's correctly translated as thankful. And the word pertains to expressing thanks uh, to someone for receiving some kind of benefit or blessing. Obviously, it's referring here to the Colossians expressing thanksgiving to the Father as a result of the Father effectually calling them into union with, a, with one body in order to experience the peace of God in their lives. Now, the word that's translated be, it's the word ginomai, and it pertains to possessing a particular characteristic which is identified by this word euharistos, uh, uh, thankful. So, therefore, this verb ginomai, translated B, correctly in the New American Standard, speaks of the Colossians possessing the characteristic of thankfulness as a result of the Father effectually calling them into union with one body at the moment of their conversion, justification. Now, uh, the word, this particular word, is in the second person plural form. It means all of you, referring to the entire Colossian Christian community, as a corporate unit, but it's also used in a distributive sense. We've seen this use quite a bit, meaning there's no exceptions. It's emphasizing that Paul wants everybody in the Colossian Christian community to be giving thanks to God, the Father, for effectually calling them into one body in order to experience the peace of God in their lives. Now, the present imperative form of this verb, gidomai, is what we call, and we see them quite a bit in this epistle, it's a customary present imperative, 
which has the force of continuing to perform some habitual activity. So the idea here is that the Colossians must continue to habitually possess the characteristic of being thankful, expressing gratitude to the Father in prayer. And they, so it's the idea with the present imperative, the customary present imperative, is they must, be continue, they must continue to be characterized as people who are thankful to God. We should be characterized as a people who are thankful. Thankful for everything in life that we have, even adversity, as we'll say a little bit later on this morning. Now, the fact that the, the, the command here doesn't mean that the Colossians weren't doing this. Uh, they were doing this. And we've talked about this quite a bit in this epistle. Every command that Paul's giving to the Colossians here, they've been doing. And the, all Paul's doing is protecting them from the false teachers and false doctrine. He's, he, want, he wants to remind them, preventative maintenance. They've heard these things before. As we saw in Colossians 1.7, Epiphras, the pastor, has been teaching them all these things that Paul is talking to them about in this epistle. So Colossians chapter 1, verses 3-5, through 5, and Colossians 2.5, they affirm that the Colossians were already obeying this command to be thankful, as well as all the commands in this particular epistle. So, if you could, go now to my translation of Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Let's start there. Colossians 3, 12 in my translation. Colossians 3.12. And, and by the way, for the, there's, obviously there's guy, men who, there are pa men that have, have contacted me that are either trained for the ministry, they're going to seminary somewhere, or they're a pastor or whatever, a sister pastor, and they'll, they'll follow the teaching. So a lot, a lot of times I'll say things as for those guys, and there are some things that might not be applicable to you, but it's, it's good that you learn these things uh, from me anyways to know what pastors, you know, some insights into what pastor's job and what, how he has to do it. But one of the things I, I would recommend to any guy who's studying the Bible in the original languages, and we should, as a pastor, everybody, everybody's at different levels of knowledge of the Word of God. Uh, not not the very few people who are scholars. But when you're a pastor, you should do your own translation. If you're teaching on Galatians or whatever the book is, you should try to come, you should have a translation of, of the passage, because when you translate, you have to interpret, and it gives you, you know, so you get to know the nuts and bolts of the passage. Uh, now, if you don't have insight in the original languages, you don't have a, uh, you, what you can, the translations we have today are done by great scholars. All the major English translations are all, all the translations I see are out there amazing. I get a greater appreciation from as I, years go by, as I'm translating uh, myself, I realize what a great job these guys do. The NIV, today's NIV, ESV, um, the Annette Bible, uh, all these translations, ESV, all these things are a great translation. So um, uh, what I say, I would recommend to a guy if he's teaching a passage is to do you have your translation. Now, you might not want to read it to your congregation. I choose to do so. Um, and uh, it helps me get better at, at it too as well. I mean, as the years go by, I'm, I think I'm a little bit better than I was years ago in translating, and that just comes with practice. So, But the, trans, the reason why I say this too is because translation, your translation reflects your interpretation. So look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, because each and every one of you are elected by God, that's the Father, holy as, as well as divinely loved, I solemnly charge the clothing of yourselves with compassion, which is the product of deep-seated affections, and also kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Simultaneously, continue making it your habit of tolerating one another, while also continuing to make it your habit of graciously forgiving each other. Whenever anyone possesses a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord in fact graciously forgave each and every one of you for his own glory, so also in the same way, each and every one of you must continue to make it your habit of graciously forgiving each other. Specifically, based upon these things, I solemnly charge each and every one of you to clothe yourselves with divine love, which is, as an eternal spiritual truth, the perfect bond of unity. Consequently, the peace produced by the teaching of the one and only Christ must continue to habitually rule within your hearts, for which purpose each and every one of you were effectually called into union with one body. Therefore, each and every one of you 
must continue to make it your habit of being characterized by thankfulness. So Paul issues another command in verse 15, and this, as we pointed out, this final command in the verse is the result of the Father effectually calling them into union with one body, that's the church of Jesus Christ, and he did this in order for them to experience the peace of God. So therefore, as a result of being effectually called by the Father at their justification in order to experience this peace of God, Paul wants the Colossians to continue to make it their habit of being characterized by thankfulness to God and prayer. Uh, a great, uh, a great um, interpreter of this particular book, Colossians, uh, Melick, Richard Melick, M-E-L-I-C-K is his, his last name. He says the following, I'm quoting, he says, the combination of thankfulness and peace is a logical one. Generally, a lack of peace results from self-seeking dis or dissatisfaction with things as they are. Thankfulness points, up, points one to the realization that all things are provided in Christ. There is no room for ill will or bitterness if thankfulness prevails. The, the epistle, he says, provides ample reasons for thankfulness, end of quote. So when we talk about thankfulness here, we should be thankful. He's, he's giving them one reason here in Colossians 3.15, Paul is, for the Colossians to be thankful to the Father, the Father has effectually called them into union with Christ, into the body of Christ, in order to experience the peace of God in their lives as individuals and amongst each other. And so that in itself should give them reasons for, for, thanking, uh, for thanking God in prayer. They should be characterized as thanksgiving to God in prayer. Now, there are many other things that Paul's brought up in this, in this chapter, let's just say, about their union identification with Christ. They're identified with Christ through the baptism of the Spirit and His crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session. And that identification, it delivers them from bondage to sin and Satan. It delivers them from personal sins. It delivers them uh, from condemnation from the law. It delivers them from spiritual death and uh, eternal condemnation and physical death. It's, 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 uh, it's the basis for their spiritual life and their fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that in itself should cause them, and would have, caused them to be thankful. And it should, as, uh, should cause us to be thankful as well. The, the things that we thank God in prayer are, are in two cat major categories. The temporal realm, and then what we got in the spiritual realm. We have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Paul said, and, uh, and, Rome, and Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. So the more, when, you look at the, when you look at the prayer life of great men of God, uh, they're, always thankful, they're always characterized by thankful. We study the prayers of Daniel, and great prayer of Daniel, and the book of Daniel. We study the prayers of Moses. We study the prayers of Jacob, and, and all these people. We study the prayers of, uh, of the great apostle Paul. And every time we learn, we learn, study these prayers, we should be incorporating the things that they thank God for or pray for into our prayer life. So that's what I do. And I try to communicate that to you, bring it back to you, what I've learned and what we should be thanking God for. You know, we should, we should thank God, uh, let's say, for, the, for uh, our leaders. Whether, and Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he told the Ephesian Christian community to thank God for their leaders, and Nero was on the throne. He was a tyrant. Because, all, because authority, legitimate authority, is given by God. All authority comes from God, and they're all going to be accountable to God. Even Satan who's the God of this world temporarily, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he has delegated authority over this earth. Now, he's the author of evil. And Michael, the, uh, the elect angel, wouldn't make a railing accusation against Satan when contending over the body of Moses, it says in the book of Jude, because Michael respected Satan's authority. So we should thank people. I say all this because we should thank uh, God for the people in authority, like Paul says to do in 1 Corinthians 2, regardless of the party. And, uh, and also, we should thank God for our jobs, obviously, the businesses, the finances that we have. Uh, look at all the, the wonderful luxuries that we have in this country with central air conditioning and you know, the crazy things that we have in refrigeration that people didn't have 100, 200 years ago in this country. We have so, cars. And uh, all kind of cars with air conditioning on them. 100, 200 years ago, they're riding in horses. 
Okay, they're riding on horses, and I mean, gee, for crying out loud, we have so many. It's just sick how unbelievably wealthy we are in this country. We should thank God for all those blessings. They're all, and all those things that really are basically uh, luxuries. We should be thanking God for all of those things. We should be thanking God for the health that we have. We take our health for granted. We really do. And some of you might say, well, my health is terrible. And it might be. It might be terrible. But whatever you do have, thank God for. Okay? And uh, thank God for, here's the other thing. We thank God for all the blessings, the good things that happen in our life. But actually, it's the tough things, the adversity, the bad things that we would say are actually turn out to be the best things many times that ever could happen to us. Depends on how you respond. So, for instance, some of us got saved because of an adversity. Some of us have grown quite a bit spiritually because of trials and tribulations. And we should thank God for all these things because everything in life works together for good for those who love God. Do they not? Right. So, we should be thanking God for everything, everything in life, trials, tribulations, the good times, the bad times, Whatever it is, the loneliness, the being around with people, um, uh, our, we should think for every, everything we have in life. No, here's why. Because all, all of our lives are under the authority and sovereign rulership of God. He is not one decision that we made or anybody else has made, men or angels, could ever take place unless God sovereignly decreed for those decisions to take place. Every circumstance in life is controlled by God. There are no accidents. That doesn't mean that God, it's, you know, it's like the matrix and God is, uh, and, you know, and God is, you know, like uh, totally, we're all robots. No. We're all, this is the, the genius of God, the wisdom of God. He's given us volition and it sovereignly coexists, it coexists with the sovereign will of God and therefore we can do, make all the decisions we're going to make and they fit right into God's plan because God's omniscient knew what we were going to do. So he sovereignly decreed for those decisions to take place. So I say all this because God is in control of our lives. You are where you are now at this point, breathing on this earth now at this point in history because he said, this is where you're going to go. And this is exactly where I want you to be. Thank God for it. Thank God you and I are in the greatest dispensation of all history, the church age in union with Christ and the, the members of the body of Christ, the future bride of Christ. We're going to go through the millennial reign with Christ. We could be overcomers who are reigning with Christ in his government because we're faithful in time. And we're going to have resurrection bodies. These bodies are going to be removed. from. Our, we're not going to have to deal with these bodies that are contaminated by sin and disease. We're going to have a resurrection body. He's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. We're going to be experiencing the new heavens and the new earth. We have everything. We've, we've given every, everything has been given to us. We're more than conquerors, as Paul said. We should thank God this is something we should be spending more time with in prayer is thanking God and thinking, making up a list if you have to, mental or on a piece of paper, on a computer, wherever you want to do it, listing the things that, that, to thank God for. Everything you could think of. And I'll tell you what, you'll find your prayer life. The, I always start off with Thanksgiving. And you'll find that your prayer, it, it, you'll be amazed how long you could spend in prayer. Just in Thanksgiving alone. So this is not the first time that Paul's mentioned Thanksgiving to the Colossians. Uh, he mentions Thanksgiving in Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. And he shared with the Colossians in that passage that he made it his habit of giving thanks to the Father for their faith at justification and that they were living according to the command to love one another. So Paul practiced Thanksgiving with regards to them. And, and he says this in Colossians chapter 1 and Colossians 1.12. Paul states that while the Colossians lived in a manner worthy of the Lord so as to be fully pleasing to him, they would be giving thanks to the Father. So here's a couple of things. Here's a thing for pastors. And, and not, we're talking about uh, you know, uh, all Christians, about th different things that we should be thanking God for. But for pastors, pastors need to thank God for their th congregations. Paul thanked God for the Colossians. He never even met them. Epiphras was their pastor, though Epiphras was Paul's delegate to them. Paul thanked God for them. We should be thanking God as pastors. And you, those who are not pastors, all of us should be thanking God for other Christians, other churches. You know, we're all on the same team, though we might not always act that way, but we are on the same team. And we should thank God, especially for those Christians 
who are faithful and persevere and are serious about the word of God and serving and giving and uh, not playing, doing the nod to God, that they're dedicated and devoted and love God with all their heart, soul, mind, strength, and their neighbors and themselves, and they're living out the gospel in their lives, and they're uh, those people who are faithful. You should be thanking God for them in your life. So thanksgiving is something that Paul has, this is the third time now, here in Colossians 3.15, that Paul's talked about thanksgiving. In fact, hop over to Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse 1 in my translation, please. Colossians 1.1. 1, 1. Colossians 1.1 1, 1 in my translation. Paul, an apostle owned by Christ who is Jesus by the will of God, along with Timothy, our spiritual brother, to the saints located in Colossae, specifically the faithful brothers and sisters in union with Christ, grace to all of you, resulting in peace from God our Father. We continue to make it our habit of giving thanks to God, namely the Father of our Lord who is Jesus who is the Christ, when we make it our habit of occupying ourselves with praying on behalf of each and every one of you as a corporate unit. So he's saying, when we're praying, we're thanking God for you. He, then he says, we do this because we heard, here's the reason why we're thanking God for you. We heard about your faith. That's their justification. They got saved. Who, so we, heard, we do this because we heard about your faith in Christ, who is Jesus. And in addition, we do this because of your love, which you continue to regularly demonstrate for the benefit of each and every one of the saints. All of you do this because of the confident expectation, which is as an eternal spiritual truth reserved in the heavens for all of you, rewards. All of you heard this by means of the teaching, this teaching on rewards, which is the truth, namely the proclamation of the gospel, which all of you continue to appropriate for the benefit of all of you. Just as in fact throughout the entire world, the gospel continues to produce fruit as well as spread, so also it continues to produce fruit as well as spread among all of you from the day all of you obeyed. So the fact that fruit is spreading among them, they were growing spiritually, affirms it also that they were being faithful already. So every command in this epistle is to just have them continue forward and to continue to persevere. So that's affirming that they've already been faithful because if the gospel would be performing fruit in their life, the character of Christ, if they were unfaithful. Right? Right. So, then he says, ver later on in the verse, he says, Consequently, all of you acquired an objective experiential knowledge of the grace originating from God by means of the truth. They couldn't get that if they were unfaithful. Just as all of you learned the truth from Epiphras, our beloved fellow servant, who is faithfully serving the Christ on behalf of each and every one of us, the one who also revealed to us your divine love by means of the Spirit's power. See, he's, uh, Epiphras, the pastor, was communicating to Timothy and Paul while Paul was under house arrest in Rome, waiting his appeal before Caesar, about the Colossians' faith at justification, they got saved, and that they were operating in the love of God. They were practicing the love of God in their lives, and this caused them to rejoice and to give thanks to the Father for them. Verse 9, for this reason also, from the day we ourselves heard about all of you, we never permit ourselves to cease making it our habit of occupying ourselves with praying on behalf of each and every one of you. Specifically, we make it our habit of occupying ourselves with making urgent requests that God would cause all of you to be filled with that which is knowing his will experientially by means of a wisdom which is absolute, the gospel, resulting in a discernment which is spiritual. The purpose would be all of you living your lives in a manner worthy of the Lord so as to be fully pleasing to him. This would result, he says, in all of you bearing fruit by means of each and every kind of action which is divine good and quality and character, and in addition, increasing and in knowing experientially God, that being the Father. Then he says, this is because all of you are empowered by means of a, empowered by means of a power which is absolute because of a power which is sovereign, namely his glory, Christ in them. The purpose of which is to perfectly embody perseverance as well as patience with joy. And then he says, all the while, all of you making it your habit of giving thanks to the Father who is qualified, each and every one of you with regards to sharing in the saints' inheritance, residing in that which is characterized by light, who, Christ, delivered each and every one of us from the dark power. We'll stop there. So thanksgiving, if you notice, Paul's saying, I want you to, pr you should be pr praying to the Father in prayer, giving thanks in prayer. I'm doing it, and 
the application for us here in the church age in the 21st century, the Spirit's telling us we need to be characterized by thankfulness in our prayers. In fact, one of the characteristics of a productive prayer life, one that's producing fruit to God, is that of thankfulness. Uh, many passages teach this. Matthew 15, 36, 26, 27, Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 6, 14, 23 of that book. Luke 22, verses 17 through 19. John 6, 11, 20 and 23, and also John 11, 41. Acts 27, 35, 28, 15. And Paul talks about thanks, thanksgiving. And Romans, look, uh, hold your place. Go to Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Almost all the epistles of Paul, not all of them, but quite a bit, the majority, he always mentions thank, he always mentions he thanks God for the, the people he's writing to, the Christian community he's writing to, whether it's Rome or Colossae or Philipp, Philippi. Look at Romans chapter 1. So if he's thanking God for other Christians, especially for faithful Christians too, absolutely. We, should, we as pastors should be thanking God for our congregations, and, uh, and especially those who are faithful, because not everybody's faithful, but especially those who are faithful, should be thanking God for all of them. And you as a Christian, if you're not a pastor, should be thanking God for all the Christians in your life. And, uh, and, and you should be thanking God for the word of God being communicated to you in, in your life by your pastor. Look at Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called it as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Why? Because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the world. See, faith is, uh, and that's not just their justifying faith. That's the faith they're demonstrating after their conversion too. And they, so notice he's giving thanks to the, the, and this is a church. He hadn't met this church yet. This actually, this whole epistle was to get them acclimated to who Paul was in his gospel because he was planning on going there because ultimately he wanted to go to Spain and evangelize Spain. And he did get to Rome, uh, but it was because of being under house arrest and appealing to Caesar. And that's how he got there. So he got there as a prisoner of the state. But he's thanking God for them. Uh, let's see, another passage we can go to with regards to Paul's epistles. Um, how about going over to uh, um, Philippians chapter 1? Look at Philippians 1. Now this church, he knew it very well. In fact... This church, out of all the churches, sought out Paul. All the thing, all the churches that Paul planted, and fe and fed the word of God to, and cared for, and and slaved over. Philippi was the only church that sought him out. He says, to find out his needs and what he where he was and if he was okay. And they were the only ones that provide him financial and material needs. The only church that did that for him. Imagine that. Look at Philippians one one. Paul. And Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Notice that. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my, in my every prayer for you all. And view, here's why. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am very confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Notice, he thanked God for these people. So thanksgiving was something that Paul did uh, communicated to the people he wrote to, the churches he wrote to quite a bit. Now, we should never, uh, never forget to thank God in prayer. If there's, if there's one thing we should never forget is thanking God in prayer. Thanking God for the people in your life, uh, adversities, good times, bad times, material blessings, spiritual blessings, 
more, more importantly, because those are things are very, very important. We should be thanking God, as I said before, uh, for our leaders. Uh, uh, look at 1 Timothy. Go to 1 Timothy, chapter 2. This is often overlooked by the church. Look at 1 Timothy 2, 1. This passage would put most evangel, a lot of, I shouldn't say, I don't know, a good portion of evangelical Christians today would be put to shame because of not practicing this for the authorities. We should be thanking for, God for our civil authorities, whether they're Democrat or Republican people. And there's no, nowhere does Paul say, oh, you can only, uh, you should only obey those leaders and give thanks for those leaders that are godly. Oh my gosh, that's absolutely crazy. Nero was on the throne when Paul wrote this. In fact, Nero was slipping into his megalomania period where he was starting to kill people. He was starting to be, he killed his mother. He was a nut, this guy. He became an absolute nut, yet God is telling, Paul's telling the Ephesian Christian community to give thanks for these people in authority, even these tyrants. And by the way, for those, think you, those uh, Christians who think, uh, think that they can only, you know, when it says in Romans 13 to obey your leaders, that they're not going to obey a leader unless he's godly and he's a godly person. Well, look at Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They only disobeyed Nebuchadnezzar when Nebuchadnezzar was telling them to sin, like practice idolatry. But other than that, they were obedient to him. Go look at that. And they were respectful to him. And he was a, he was a butcher, and he was a, he was a wicked, pagan, ungodly man. He ended up getting saved because of the, the ministry of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But he wasn't a nice guy, people. So those Christians really got to get out there who, who think that they can only obey and give thanks to those leaders that are godly, or they think are godly. Or, pfft. You're dreaming. I don't know what Bible you're reading. It ain't my Bible that you're reading. You gotta read some other Bible that you're writing in yourself because you just want things to be the way you want it to be. You want to put God's words in God's mouth, and you're you're foolish to doing that. You're gonna give an account for that for that kind of behavior and that kind of attitude. We gotta do what God's word says. And listen to me tell you, you're never gonna grow up if you every time you see something in God's word that rubs you the wrong way, you and I have a choice to either do it or disobey it. There's no sitting on the fence. To neglect it is to disobey. So when you're, gro when you're growing and you hear the word of God taught, and if you really want to grow, you will be confronted with things in God's word you're not going to like sometimes. You're going to say, really? Are you kidding me? I remember the first time I heard, I was reading my Bible, and I remember the first time I really got serious. I said, it said, you need to love your mother. You need, whoever's, uh, you're not worthy to be my disciple unless you love me more than your mother and your father and your brothers and sisters and all that. I was like, oh my gosh, I love my family. He wasn't saying not to love your family. He's saying, don't love the, your family more than me because I gave you your family. I'm your God. I created you and saved you. And that used to rub me. The, I, was like, I had a hard time with that. But as the years went by, I learned, I was like, you know, I was like yeah, that makes total sense. And I, I can do that and understand that now. But that comes with maturity. I'm not saying I've arrived, but that, there are some things in God's word that are going to rub you the wrong way because we have a sin nature. We live in the devil's world. We think that we know. We think that we're, we're, we, we're what does it say in Proverbs? A man is always, is always right in his own eyes. We always like to think that we have, you know, we're the cat's meow. No, no. We all need God's word to correct us because we get some crazy thoughts in our heads sometimes that comes from the devil's world or other un obviously other ungodly people or you might have learned it from your family and they're, you know, wrong. You know, you've got to make changes according to God's word and that's how you grow. And if you're never being confronted in Bible class or your Bible study and things, oh, man, and that's something just like, it's like, oh my gosh, that's like, I can't believe this. That's a good sign. That means God's working on you. <laughs> it means he's working on you. So pray and ask God to help you with this and how to, and, and to apply this and, uh, and do it and be uh, doing. Remember what Jesus said? Not my will, fathers, but yours be done. Okay? We need to say God's will is revealed in his word. So we have to say your will be done, not what I want. I might not like what you say here. But eventually we have to come to the point where we love what he says because we understand the wisdom behind it. Sometimes we won't know until we grow further 
and then we'll learn the wisdom behind it. First Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2.1, first of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. Notice it doesn't say just the godly men. <laughs> for kings and for all those who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. It's pleasing to him when we do this. And, he, and here's another reason why you should be praying for your leaders, especially the ungodly ones. Desi God desires all men to be saved and to be come to the knowledge of the truth. So the, 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 the political person that you don't like, they, you might not like them. And you know why you might not like them? They might be an ungodly person. And you're right to not like them for their ungodly behavior. But they're a person that needs Jesus, don't, don't they? Aren't, didn't Christ come to save sinners? What do we just, we just take out, we throw out all the political party and that we don't, we don't, that doesn't apply to them? The political party that you're opposed to? Or the political persuasion you're opposed to? Come on, we gotta grow up. There's one God and one mediator, mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, and who, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Now go back uh, to Colossians chapter 1, please. Actually, go to Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 first. So our gratitude, people, demonstrates our respect and appreciation for God's grace policy who blesses us with, with, without us ever earning or deserving these blessings. We have unmerited blessings. We didn't earn or deserve the blessings that we have. It was given to us by God's grace, meaning we don't earn or deserve it, and that's humbling. So Colossians chapter 4, I, have, I want you to go there. Colossians chapter 4. And look at it says in verse 2. Colossians 4, 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. The Net Bible translate this, translates this verse. Be devoted to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. The today's NIV says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. The ESV, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. The New Living Translation, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. In the Lexham Bible, be devoted to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. They all pretty much sound the same, don't they? Attitude of thanksgiving. An attitude of gratitude we need to have. But so he says, praying, verse 3, at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been in prison that I may make it clear in the way that I ought to speak. Now, notice something they learned from Paul. You should be praying. Paul's asking for prayer that he would speak boldly. Doors would open up for him to communicate the word of God to more people. You should be praying that for me and who all pastors that God will open up the doors and give your pastor boldness of speech. Because you know what? Standing before some people, it can be very scary. As a, you, you might think, oh, he comes in. No, the boldness comes from the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you, you, come, you stand in front of some people and you know that they don't like what you're saying. But you've got to go out and speak boldly the full counsel of God and not hold anything back. You, they need to hear the truth and love and that takes a lot of courage, especially when you're standing up before people who, who have daggers in their eyes. Some people have daggers in it. They, don't, they hate Christianity, but you have, you have to have boldness of speech. So you should be praying for your pastor. For just the way Paul was requesting prayer from the Colossians, you should be praying for your, your pastor and other pastors. J just what he asked, he asked there for, that, the word, that I might speak the mystery of Christ and I might speak it clearly in a way I ought to speak, with boldness, obviously. So notice the attitude of thanksgiving. So what we have here is uh, in Psalm 9.1, this is a great verse, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. Now also, the believer should always give thanks to the Father for his gift of salvation, namely the Lord Jesus Christ, the God, man, Savior. Paul does that, says that in 2 Corinthians 9, 15. He says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And who is that? Jesus Christ. We should be thanking God for his son and what he did for us at the cross. And what he's doing for us now, 
sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us in prayer, and what he's going to do for us in the future, give us a resurrection body and rewards if we're faithful, and allow us to reign with him during his millennial reign. Psalm 50 verse 23 teaches that the believer who offers thanksgiving to the Father in prayer honors him. You honor God when you give him thanks. Psalm 50 verse 23, he who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me, and to him who orders his way aright, I shall show the salvation of God. So we're to give thanks to, uh, for, uh, for, to God for other believers in our congregation. We pointed that out earlier. And this too glorifies God, if done with proper motivation, which is to worship God in prayer and not to make ourselves look holy. Psalm 35, verse 18. I will give thanks, uh, I will give you thanks in the great congregation. I will praise you among the mighty throng. That could be done through song or other ways verbally expressed. We're to give thanks to God for both adversity and prosperity, since both come from Him. Uh, look at, uh, for, uh, you don't have to hold your place, one more passage. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.18 1 Thessalonians 5.18 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the New American Standard says, In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Uh, the, uh, the Net Bible, in everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The Today's NIV, give thanks in all circumstances. That's how I translate it. For this is God's will for you in, in Christ Jesus. Everything means in all situations, all circumstances, whether things are going bad or good in your life, adversity or prosperity, when, you're, when, you're ch when you're, your wife has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, uh, when your child is sick, when, when you are losing your health and having problems and difficulties, when you've just lost a job, <laughs> give thanks to God, because you know God's that's working on you in your life to shape and mold you into the image of Christ, not to make your life a highway, my life a highway. He, his goal is to form us in the image of Christ. And if his son suffered, and he used Christ, was, uh, uh, was, had suffered himself, our master and Lord and Savior, so are we going to go through suffering and adversity and persecution at times? So the, the, today's NIV says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The ESV, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. So you can see a lot of the trend, ESV and today's NIV are interpreting in everything and, uh, as being all circumstances. Jesus Christ, he employed thanksgiving to God in prayer when performing miracles. Uh, Mark, uh, Matthew 14, 19 teaches this. And in chapter 15, verse 36 in that book, Mark 6, 41 and 8, 6, Luke 9, 16, and John 6, 11. In fact, in, in, in John's gospel, chapter 11, verse 41, before he raised Lazarus from the dead, he thanked the Father for answering him, and he raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus Christ also offered a prayer of thanksgiving to the Father when he instituted the Lord's Supper for the church. That's in Mark 14, 22 through 25, Luke chapter 22, verses 17 and 19, and you can also see 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26. Jesus Christ was characterized by thanksgiving to his Father. And are we supposed to be like Christ? We should be characterized by thankfulness to the Father, just like the Son was, so we can reflect who Christ is to a lost and dying world and show that we're disciples of our Savior. Now let's go into the communion service. We'll segue into the communion service. And while the communion elements are being passed out, I'll sing us a song. And the song I want to do is a love song to my Savior because that's kind of like a song of thanksgiving. So that's on the first page of our songbook. So a love song to our Savior and uh, and we'll have the communion elements uh, passed out during that time.
mais sério If you have your hands free, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Thank you, Bill, for passing out the communion elements. 1 Corinthians 11, 23. Now we come to the Lord's Supper, and this is a time when we can give thanks to the Father for His Son, Jesus Christ, and thinking, uh, thanking Him for the person and work of Christ. Remember, Jesus Christ is the God-man, and uh, what He did on the cross for us, His death on the cross, is portrayed by the juice. The bread is portraying his person, his impeccable person, his sinless person. Remember, he had to be sinless for the Father to accept his sacrifice for our sins. He could not accept anything less than perfection. That's why God, not uh, himself, the Son, not a man, not another man or an angel could do this. Only the Son of God himself could do this. So, Jesus Christ is both God and man. When we study 1 John, uh, that's going to be a great study. That prologue is amazing. And it talks about, the, uh, John says, we were historical eyewitnesses to the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was both God and man. He demonstrated this by his words and his actions. And so Jesus Christ is, this is called the hypostatic union in theology, that Jesus Christ is undiminished deity and true sinless humanity and one person forever. In other words, he's 100% deity and 100% a human, human being. Uh, he has all the attributes of the Father and the Spirit, and having all those attributes is not diminished at all by being a human being. He has all the attributes of a human being that we have, a human nature, except that he's without sin and he's God. And just because he's God, it doesn't mean that any of his human attributes are diminished in any way whatsoever. So he is as much of a human being as you and I, yet without sin. And he is, very, he is equal to the Father in the Spirit. And he demonstrated this. Uh, not only by his words and his actions and his control over nature and walking on the water, but ultimately by rising from the dead, as we read in Romans 1-4 not too long ago. So when we look at the bread, we're looking at the person of Christ and his impeccable human nature. And then uh, we see that the juice uh, the, speaks of the blood of Christ, and the blood of Christ in Scripture speaks of his death, in particular, his spiritual and physical deaths on the cross. Remember, the first Adam died spiritually as, as a result of eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then he died physically uh, 900 years later. So Christ had to die, the last Adam, had to die spiritually, and then he died physically. He died spiritually, it's mentioned in, was it Matthew 27, 46, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Father, during those last three hours on the cross, abandoned his Son in his human nature, and he experienced through his human nature, the Son did, this abandonment, as a human being, and that was the payment for our sins. And when he said, and when he when he was alive, and he before he died physically, he said, "Tetelestai is finished, paid in full." What was paid in full? The sin debt. 
So when he died spiritually, remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was, he was, he was, he was uh, under tremendous duress about what was to take place. Not so much the physical suffering, it was this abandonment that he would experience from his father, an abandonment that he would never, has never faced at all. Uh, he would be suffering a substitutionary spiritual death in our place. That's what was the, ter the tremendous fear he had. But he said, not my will, Father, but yours be done. The only way to explain his fear in the Garden of Gethsemane for the cup that he was a face was to understand that he was going to face spiritual death as a human being in our place and do it voluntarily. So he did that so we would never be separated from God for all of eternity. But then he had to die physically, not only to, uh, to fulfill the prophecies of the resurrection, but he also had to die physically to give us, to solve the problem of the sin nature that indwells our physical bodies. So giving us a resurrection body would replace that of body that we have now contaminated by sin. So he had to be raised from the dead to give us the guarantee of a resurrection body and that resurrection body would permanently eradicate the sin nature from our lives. So Christ, uh, when we speak of the death of Christ, those deaths did a couple, a couple of many things. One, it redeemed us out of the slave market of sin in which we were all born physically alive but spiritually dead. It reconciled us to a holy God, us sinners, and it also propitiated the Father and His holiness demanded that sin and sinners be judged. So He didn't want to judge us and, and, and condemn us, so he, he judged His Son in our place as our substitute so that we could have a fellowship and a relationship with Him, the Son, and the Spirit. So when we take, when we look at the communion elements, knowing these things about the person of Christ and knowing these things about what he did on the cross are giving us material to thank God for, to thank the Father for. So when we come into the communion service, we're to here to give thanks to the Father for his son on the cross. And you could say, Jesus, you could talk to Jesus if you want to say, hey, thank you, Father. Thank you, Son, uh, Jesus, Lord Jesus, for doing this for me. Nothing wrong with that. So what we see here, it, you're not, and I know some people say, oh, you're praying to Jesus. No, I'm not praying to Jesus. You can thank Jesus. If, if you, no problem with that. You're in fellowship with him. You're having fellowship with him anyways. You're not offering a request to him. When he talks about requests in, the, in Thanksgiving, talk to the Father when you give requests, but and, and not talk to him to request. You pray to the Father in my name, and he'll give you the request. So thanking him for, for what he did on the cross is not a sin. So... Uh, we have, this is the communion elements in, our, in, in front of us. That's what they represent. And now this is what we need to reflect upon. So what I would like to do uh, is before we read 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 through 26, I want us to take a few moments, a couple of minutes of meditation and thanking the Father in prayer for his son, Jesus Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11:23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, 
This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread in remembrance of our Lord. Verse 25, Paul says, In the same way the Lord took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the cup in remembrance of the Lord's death. Verse 26, Paul says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to worship you and your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for everyone here this morning, not only in the Thompson home here in Iowa, but those who might be viewing or listening to this class live through the website or at a later date through the recordings on the website. We thank you for each and every one of them. We pray that this lesson this morning in Colossians 3.15 would be a blessing to your people. Guide them in the application of what they have learned here this morning. And we pray that it would benefit, be a benefit them, to them spiritually and in particular their prayer lives. And we just thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, bring into remembrance the death of your son and who he is and what he did for us at the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. We thank you so much for him and what he did for us at the, uh, at the cross and dying for us when we were yet his enemies and also raising him from the dead for our justification. We thank you also for the gift of the Spirit and his work in our lives from regeneration to resurrection. And we pray that the Spirit would do a mighty work through all of us here this morning as we contemplate, meditate upon what you've taught us this morning and apply it in our lives. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, I want to do as a congregational song, uh, Everybody Sing. Um, I was going to do another one, but that's a good song. That's kind of like a Thanksgiving song. So uh, that's on page 39. Everybody Sing. And uh, we're going to take up an offering, a Sunday morning offering, while I'm singing that song. Uh, this is, uh, should be, an when we take up this offering, this is, uh, when we give, it should be in obedience to Galatians 6, 6, uh, that those who are uh, taught the word of God to share all good things with those who teach them, those who communicate the gospel, 1 Corinthians 9, to get their living from the gospel, and there are other passages in 1 Timothy 5, which talk about uh, providing for uh, and uh, the pastor in response to what he's given you, the word of God. So um, I'd like to thank those who have been uh, supporting this ministry, not, here, not only here in Iowa, but those who have been faithful uh, uh, in supporting the ministry, people on our internet ministry that have been supporting us. I'd like to thank them as well. And of course, you're my joint partners by doing so. That's what Paul taught the Philippians when they gave to him and supported him. You're joint partners with me in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so let's pray for this offering. Father, we pray that this offering would be given in motivation and obedience to Galatians 6, 6 and other passages, and thus by the power of the Spirit. We pray that your people will be blessed by the given. We know that your son taught us more blessed to give than to receive, and that also that the recipient would give many thanksgiving to you, Father, as a result of this offering. And we thank you again for the finances that you've given to us so that we can uh, give back to you and the support of the gospel which proclaims the excellencies of your son, Jesus Christ. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, could you all rise, please? <clears throat>